Good morning, everyone. Those of you that don't know, I'm George. Most of you do, but I see some new faces. Good to see you guys. Welcome. We're glad you're here. Um, yeah, it's even colder up here, actually. <laughs> Surprisingly. You know, I always thought it's weird being on a stage. It's uncomfortable for me. I feel like I'm talking down to you guys, you know? But uh, I guess it focuses attention. That's the purpose. Um, the tortoise and the hare. Familiar story, right? To most of us, there's a, there's a tortoise and a rabbit, a turtle and a rabbit, who decide to get into a race. The tortoise moves ever so slowly. The rabbit just takes off. And, uh, and then he gets so far ahead, he decides that, well, I can take a break. He takes a nap. Tortoise passes him. He's like, uh oh. Takes off. Uh, passes the tortoise, gets way ahead of him, takes another nap, loses the race, right? That's the short version, just in case you've never heard it. Um, tortoise and the hare. That's a story that... Am I doing something bad, Reed? Okay. Um, the tortoise and the hare is a story that's meant to teach us something, right? It's a story that kids are familiar with and they like to listen to. If you tell it right, I didn't tell it right. But if you, if you tell it good, you know, the kids, the kids like to listen to it, but it's got a moral, it's got a, it's got a reason for being written, right? It's, got, it's trying to communicate something to us, and what is that? Anyone? It's going to be more like a classroom session today, so I need people to answer my questions. What's, what's the story of the tortoise and the hare trying to teach us, in your own words? Slow and steady wins the race. Perfect, right? We've got to be persistent. We can't just, you know, boom, 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 get arrogant. Stories have meaning. It's the same in fictional stories and non-fictional stories. People write intentionally. The, the details they include, the details they don't include, are there for a reason because they want us to understand something from the story. And today, the story that we're going to be going over is that of Jonah. It's a very familiar story to many of us, right? This guy, well, I won't give it away, just in case you've never heard it. Um, but I want you guys to think, and I'll be asking you at the end, what is this story about? What is the book of Jonah about? What's being communicated in this story? Think about how it progresses, how it's told, and especially how it ends. All right, here we go. Jonah. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come before me. We'll pause there. First verse, right? At this pace, we'll be done with chapter 4 in about three hours. <laughs> Who were the Ninevites? Who were the Ninevites? They were Assyrians. Nineveh was a city in Assyria. This is starting to bother me. It must be bothering you guys. Um, Nineveh was a, was a city in Assyria. Very important city, eventually became the capital city of the Assyrian Empire. Big deal, right? Wasn't at this time. But to Jonah, these guys were enemies. Enemies, okay? The Ninevites had conquered the land of Israel several times. They had become the overlords of the Israelites. And this is a nation who's like, God should be our king. And then here are these Assyrian rulers ruling over us. They had sacked towns, murdered Israelites, and tortured them. Very, very brutal people. Right? Try it again. Sorry, this is super distracting, I know. Very, very brutal people. Right? And their wickedness had come before God, it says. It's the sit, go to the city of Nineveh, preach against it. Its wickedness has come up before me. And that tells, that tells Jonah, a prophet of God, something. Right? Its wickedness has come before me. It's not just like, I see it. Of course, God sees all the wickedness, but he's like, I'm about to do something about it, which is, in the case of all these wicked, pagan, godless, torturing people, I'm going to destroy the city, right? That's, that's what God's about to do. Jonah understands that. Judgment is coming. And God says, go and preach against it. Go and preach against it. Now, before we see what Jonah does, for those of us who don't know the story, picture yourself in Jonah's shoes, right? And maybe... ISIS is about to lose a capital city that it has, 50,000 fighting men at the least, at the judgment of God. And then he says to you, to one of us in here, I want you to go warn them. Can you imagine? 
imagine that? That's what this was like to Jonah. I want you to go and warn them. What would you do? What would you do? Right? Think about all the horrific things that the Islamic State is doing in the Middle East. And God told you to go warn them that he's about to destroy them. How would you respond? Well, we'll see what Jonah did. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. We put that map up, Mike. So just to give us some context, here's Israel over here, right? Jonah goes to Jaffa, which is modern-day Tel Aviv. It's still a city to this day. Isn't that fascinating? And instead of going to Nineveh, which was up here, sorry, I couldn't get a better map, it was in Iraq, northern Iraq. So here's, a, here's southwestern Iraq. Northern Iraq was Nineveh. Jonah takes a ship that's bound, probably, for Spain. The exact opposite, right? And think about how long that journey would have been. It, and now Tarshish, like I said, we're not exactly sure where it is. It may have been in Tunis. But either way, super long distance, okay? This is Jonah's response to the Lord's command. I'm going as far away from, I can, uh, uh, far away from Assyria as I can. And uh, ships that went to Tarshish from Jaffa typically took about three years to return. He was going there for a long time, and it was a very long journey. Right? He goes, he, he pays a lot of money to get a ship to Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Okay, and what do you think? Did this please God? Probably not, right? Probably not. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea. And such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid. Each one cried out to his own God. And they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck where he lay down and he fell into a deep sleep. No idea why. That's what he did. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us and we will not perish. So everybody's calling on their patron deity, right? Because this is a very polytheistic culture. You know, everybody's got their own family gods and, and whatever. And so they're like, well, maybe your god can prevail upon whatever god in the pantheon is causing this, right? Because family deities, in their mind, were usually just kind of localized. They didn't really exert much power over the cosmos as a whole, you know? But they're like, somebody's mad at us. Some god is mad at us. That's how they're, you know, they're uh, perceiving this storm. And so that doesn't help. They cast lots skipping a little bit of the story. They cast lots. Lot falls on Jonah, and they talk to Jonah, and they're like, what, who are you? What are you doing? What, what's this about? Please explain yourself, right? And he says this, I'm a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. This terrified them. That's what the text says. This terrified them. Why? Because they're appealing to their patron deities to maybe prevail upon some bigger God, and Jonah's like, I serve the God that actually made it, and it's like, whoa, you serve a God that could actually be doing this to us. Okay, and um, what have you done? And they knew, and it says here, they knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. So running away from a God didn't scare them as much because, again, patron deities usually localized to where you're from, don't really exert power other places. But Jonah's like, actually, the God that I serve is the God of heaven and earth. And they freak out because they're like, your God is doing this. Your God is doing this to us. So what should we do? They ask him, what should we do to you? <laughs> to make the sea calm down for us? Imagine answering that question. Um, And here's what Jonah says, pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you, which for Jonah was surely a death sentence, even with calm water. Even if the waters calmed down, that was a death sentence for him, being thrown into the ocean in the middle of nowhere. But instead, interestingly, the men didn't want to didn't want to kill him just yet, because they're afraid his God is causing this. They don't want to kill Jonah. And so they try and row back. Doesn't work. Doesn't work. Then they cry out to the Lord. They realize we're going to have to do this. They cry out to the Lord and say, Oh, Lord, please do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. For you, O Lord, have done as you please. Then they took Jonah and they throw him overboard. They know it's a death sentence too. They throw him overboard and the raging sea grew calm. At this the men greatly feared the Lord. They offered a sacrifice to the Lord and they made vows to him. Okay? So they're like, this God answered us. We're going to give an offering. This is a normal thing to do. This is a normal thing to do in that culture, right? So we're going to give him an offering. We're going to acknowledge that this happened, and this guy's dead. That's a bummer. That's a real bummer. 
Um, but the Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was inside the fish three days and three nights. And when I heard this story as a kid, I always thought that the fish was kind of God's judgment, because what comes after this, spoiler alert, is a prayer in chapter 2. And I always thought Jonah's praying for deliverance from like the fish that swallowed him, but you know, it, it, it hit me as I was reading, it's like, no, actually, the sea was his death sentence, and the fish is his salvation, because what follows is actually a psalm of thanksgiving, right? Because he would have drowned otherwise. He would have drowned otherwise. And so he prays, this, he prays this prayer, which was probably a psalm he had memorized already, because it doesn't mention the fish or anything that has happened. It's just kind of a, a prayer of thanksgiving. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, in my distress... I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From the depths of the grave, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the deep, into the very heart of the seas, and the current swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. Again, a death sentence. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again to your holy temple. I ran from you, but I will call on you. I will call on you. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains, I sank very poetic. The earth beneath barred me in forever, but you brought my life up from the pit, O Lord my God. Sounds a lot like the Psalms we read, doesn't it? When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. Remember the Assyrians, these pagans, thinking about this. But I will sacrifice to you with a song of thanksgiving. What I have vowed, I will make good. Salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. That was his salvation, that fish. So let's take stock so far. We're done with chapter 2. Jonah rebels from God's instruction, a prophet of all people to do so. And he runs the opposite direction. There's a storm. He's thrown overboard. He's saved. And how does this experience change Jonah? Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh, as we saw on the map, it's about a month by caravan. It'd take about 25 days to 30 days by caravan. Um, or maybe two hours on a 747, just to give us some idea of like how far away this is. Uh, now Nineveh was a very important city. So Jonah had a, has a month to think about this, right? Nineveh was a very important city, a visit required three days. He had to proclaim in all these public places, you know, this, this, this prophecy of doom, essentially. On the first day, the first day, Jonah started into the city. He proclaimed, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. Unless you repent, unless you whatever. No, he just said, 40 days, you guys are done. End of story. You're going to be judged, you're going to be destroyed. That's the message from God to you, my God to you. And the Ninevites, on the first day, Listen to this. Believed God. On day one, contrast Jonah's disobedience. They declared a fast, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on, a sack, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, the king of Nineveh, to this foreign prophet, he believes it, right? He covered himself with sackcloth, removed his royal robes, and he sat down in the dust. This is a symbol of mourning, right? Then he issued a pro proclamation in Nineveh. By the decree of the king... And his nobles did not let any man or beast, herd or flock, taste anything. Did not let them eat or drink. Everybody's fasting. Okay? Everybody is being penitent before this guy's God. Right? Who knows? This is what the king says in verse 9. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, this is verse 10. He had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. So this is great, right? This is great. If we were to stop the story right here, this is straight up a Hallmark movie. You know, bad things happen, and then our protagonist, you know, things really turn around, and, and people are penitent before the Lord, and then boom, awesome. Deliverance, disaster averted, Hallmark movie. I love it. But there's a fourth chapter, all right? But Jonah... Chapter 4, verse 1. But Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. He prayed to the Lord, O Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? This is why, 
on Jonah's lips, he's telling us why he ran now. This is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. Way over there. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, O oh Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. Which sounds like a very pouty thing to say. But he's just super angry. He's not as much pouting. Jonah is furious that these Ninevites, these pagan Ninevites, who oppressed his people, destroyed Israelite homes, killed his brethren, were not judged. He is furious at God. And he said, I would rather die than live in this reality. I would rather die than live in this reality. And imagine... Jonah has run from God, been rescued, preached, the city pleads for God's mercy. He gives it. And Jonah's angry. And what do you think God does at this point with his prophet? What do you think God does at this point with his prophet? Might be a good time to say, well, you don't get it, Jonah. But he doesn't. He tries to teach him. He tries to teach him. But the Lord replied, Have you any right to be angry? Jonah went out and sat down at a place east of the city where he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. He'd probably been hoping to see it destroyed from this vantage point, but now all he can do is look down, dejected, at the fortune that the Ninevites just found and the favor from God. Despite God's objection, right, because God said, Do you have any right to be angry, Jonah? Despite God's objection, he feels like he has every right to be angry. Then, the Lord God provided a vine. Okay, We're about to have another teaching moment. The Lord God provided a vine and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the vine. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the vine so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die again. And he said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, do you have a right to be angry about the vine? The question is different. Do you have a right to be angry about me being merciful to Nineveh? No. Do you have a right to be angry about this vine? I do, he said. I love Jonah's persistence. I do. He's being honest. I do. I'm angry enough to die. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this vine. Though you did not tend it or make it grow, it sprang up overnight and died overnight. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left. And many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about that great city? And thus, and that's the end of the book, and thus Jonah is indicted. He cares more about a plant that brings him comfort than a hundred thousand people he deems unworthy of God's mercy. And that's how the book ends. So, if the book of Jonah is meant to teach us something, what would you say it is? Not a rhetorical question. Classroom, remember? If we're paying attention, Jonah's, okay, it's about Jonah. Jonah's our main character. And God keeps coming back to Jonah, and the story keeps coming back to Jonah. What are we, what's the book of Jonah teaching? Anybody have an idea? I think Shannon knows the answer. Reed, what's the book of Jonah teaching? That's great. That's really good. God has the right to have mercy on whoever he wants to, despite Jonah's serious objection. That's the, that's the story of Jonah. It's not about a fish. It's not about a whale. It's not about three days underwater. It's about God having the right to have mercy on whomever he wants to. Jonah hated the Assyrians and saw them as undeserving of a prophetic warning. They don't deserve it. By contrast, so we're getting into Jonah's head now. By contrast, 
he gladly received God's mercy for himself when he was rescued from certain death in the ocean and also when a plant brought him shade, a lesser mercy, but something that he still very much appreciated. Right? So Jonah thought a combination of two things. A combination of two things. I deserve mercy. I deserve mercy. They do not deserve mercy. I deserve mercy. They do not deserve mercy. And why would he think that? I mean, God had chosen Abraham, after all. He was a descendant of Abraham. He was an Israelite. He had the lineage. He was ritually pure. He was a prophet. He had this election. He was chosen. God's mouthpiece on earth. And I deserve mercy is where that took him. I deserve mercy. The Ninevites, the Ninevites do not deserve mercy. They have tortured, killed, oppressed. They're pagans. They're idol worshipers. They're polytheists. Right, because monotheism was a big thing back in their time. We kind of take it for granted. For Israelites to be monotheistic was a big deal. No, we worship one God, the God of heaven, right? And what's God's response to that? What's God's response to that? To Jonah saying, they're enemies of God, and you can just sense the self-righteousness. They're enemies of God. They don't deserve it. God says, they're mine to have mercy on, Jonah. These people are mine to have mercy on, just as much as you were when I saved you from the sea. Just as much as you were mine to have mercy on when I saved you from the sea. So what is God trying to convince Jonah of? that he can have compassion on whoever he wants to. He can have compassion on whomever he wants to. So what does that mean for us? What does that mean for us? I think it's easy. I think it's easy for us in church to say, yes, everyone deserves God, God's mercy. I wouldn't have been like Jonah. Okay, nice thought. Let's go home. We know what the right answer is and what the wrong answer is, and we jump to the right answer. I do this all the time. I think we all do it. We want to champion the light. No bad thoughts. Well, at least not here. Yes, God, God has the right to have mercy on whoever he wants. It's very basic, George. Thank you for telling me. But what sorts of things do you think about other people throughout the week? What sorts of things come out of your mouth about other people, groups of people, other cultures? Who are the people that you would walk by with your heart closed and your eyes looking the other direction? When we hear stories like this, we don't like to identify with the bad guy or the bad example. In this case, Jonah, ironically. No, we try to, we tend to paint ourselves and our minds in the best light possible. But when we do that, when we do that without honest reflection, we rob ourselves of the benefit of prophecy and scripture in the first place, God speaking to us. We try and hide. Kill him this morning. It fell, didn't it? It fell, man. Is there a handheld or something? I'll just use this. I'll use this. It's going to happen every Sunday, I promise. Test, test. Okay. We rob ourselves of the benefit of prophecy if we do that. We try and hide in a house of cards from ourselves, running from insecurity, because when we wish to live lives that please God but see areas where we don't, we do feel insecure, don't we? I do. And we feel like hiding that thing, ignoring that thing, covering up that thing with words or positive emotions or whatever means we wish to, to cope psychologically with that dissonance that we sense. And it's dangerous because when we do it enough, we become whitewashed individuals, bereft of the chance for renewal that comes with honest encounters with God. So I invite you to reflect honestly on this story, to let your guard here, let your guard down here, sitting with your family, dysfunctional as we may be at times, and sitting with God, because he is here in this place. And to see 
that same tendency in your own life that we saw in Jonah. I deserve mercy. They do not deserve mercy. Jonah embodies our bias. Jonah embodies our bias. I deserve mercy. They do not deserve mercy. And if we're thinking about it in terms of what does this mean? How does this apply to me? There are people in our lives that we refuse to extend compassion to. There are people in our lives that we refuse to extend compassion to. Is it Spanish-speaking people? Maybe lower-class workers from south of the border, whether from Central America or South America? Do East Asian cultural norms and practices bother you? Do you dismiss upper-middle-class Americans? Are the wealthy deserving of mercy? Maybe it's the gay community. Refuse to extend compassion to them. Maybe it's more individual. A parent who abandoned you. A husband who spurns you. A friend who betrayed you. Maybe it's people who smoke. I've actually heard that before. <laughs> Maybe it's Muslims. You get uncomfortable around them and you see them as a threat to your safety. It's a black people. I've met plenty of people who get uncomfortable around black people, particularly if they don't look like they're middle or upper class black people. Think about the vitriol and the heartless criticism that the Black Lives Matter movement received. I've heard it from friends, colleagues, relatives, I've read it all over the place. People reacting violently against such a self-evident truth that the lives of black people are just as valuable as Indian lives or white lives or Arab lives. But we're so inclined to condemn and get defensive and self-justify and say without thinking, they deserve what they get, all while pardoning ourselves of our many shortcomings. All while pardoning ourselves of our many shortcomings. They deserve compassion. Or they, I deserve compassion, they do not. That's Jonah. That's Jonah. He ran from God, rebelled from what God told him to do, was about to die, and who saved him? God saved him. God saved rebellious Jonah. But his, but his response, even after that miraculous encounter, what was it? I deserve compassion, they do not. And at the end of the book, we see that Jonah is so twisted by his hatred and bias that he rejects the most basic of value systems. He cares more about a plant than he does the lives of an entire group of human beings. A city of over 100,000. His perspective is so skewed by self-interest and by rightful condemnation of the holy other Assyrians that these Assyrians, or that they represent, that he devalues their lives below a shrub. They deserve it. I deserve salvation from death. I deserve comfort in the form of this plant. Those women and children who die as collateral damage and bomb strikes used as a human shield by Hamas or ISIS, they get what they deserve. They're reaping the fruit of their culture. Well, lower income black families just reap the fruit of their culture. He should have just listened to that police officer. I hear stuff like this a lot. And when we categorically dismiss an entire culture or race or an individual and dehumanize them so that we can live and we do it with individuals in our lives too, we dehumanize people who have hurt us. But God interrupts Jonah's and our self-righteousness to say, these people are my creation. Just like that plant that, that comforted you and gave you shade, 
they, Jonah, are worthy of my compassion. That homeless man who has made every bad choice he could have, and you rightly condemn him, he is worthy of my compassion. That culture you fear, that friend who hurt you, those people you slander, they are worthy of my compassion. That's what God says. And what do we think our status is above people that we view this way? I imagine some things come to mind, some bias that you have. What intrinsic value do you have over those that you judge and exclude and condemn? Do you remember the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector in the temple? It's in the Gospels. Jesus tells a story about a tax collector who was a very bad and very bad man, cheated people out of their money, very looked down upon in society, basically excluded from the temple in a lot of places. And Jesus says a Pharisee and a tax collector went to the temple to pray. The Pharisee goes on and on before God about all his accomplishments and how righteous he is and how holy he is and how good he is and how holy other he is from those tax collectors, right? And then the tax collector stands before God beating his chest saying, I am not worthy, I am a sinner, I am this. And he goes on and on and on, appealing to God for mercy, right? Appealing to God for mercy. And Jesus, and who, and who does Jesus say left that place justified? That's the word he used, justified. Who left that place justified? The tax collector. The tax collector. What intrinsic value do you think you have over those you judge? Narrow is the path that leads to life. To life. And there are few who find it. Narrow is the path that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Jesus said that. Remember that familiar story of the Good Samaritan? We've all heard it before, I think. It starts out as Jesus answering a question. Somebody comes up to him, and he's like, what do I do, master, teacher? What do I do to inherit life, or to inherit eternal life, to, to inherit, inherit eternal life? This is the question being asked. And Jesus is like, well, what do you think? He's like, love God, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus is like, hey, good job. And he's feeling good about himself, right? The self-justification. He's feeling good about himself. I answered correctly. And then it says in the text, seeking to justify himself, seeking to justify those people that he has no compassion on, he says, well, who is my neighbor? Or Jesus, um, he says, well, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Right? Who do I not have to give compassion to? Who do I not have to love? Who do I not have to love? And Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan. And at the end of it, Jesus asks him the question, who was this man's neighbor? Do you know how he responds? The one who showed him mercy. The one who showed him mercy. God has the right to give mercy to whomever he wishes. So like Jonah, we pride ourselves some of us, in our heritage as Christians, people who worship Christ the Lord in our pursuit of holiness, not sinning. But Jesus interrupts our self-satisfaction and says mercy is mandatory, just like holiness. God interrupted Jonah and said, as a matter of fact, these godless people without me and without guidance of scripture and my law, that's what that comment about, they don't know the right hand from their left. They, 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 they're morally, they're like children, uninformed. These people deserve my mercy just as much as you did when you were about to drown. And did you know that this extensive compassion of God, this expansive compassion of God is actually our legacy as Gentiles? Our legacy as Gentiles, people who aren't Jewish, just like Jonah objected to the Ninevites receiving God's mercy, so too the majority of the Jews in the time of Jesus and the apostles refused to accept the thought that Gentiles, culturally, ritually impure, and not part of the covenant, rejected by God, could actually be a part of God's kingdom and receive God's faithful covenant love and carry the Holy Spirit 
of God. That's what Jesus, the perfect, pure Jew, did for you. And it's what he did for me. And we now, like they did 2,000 years ago, would stomp on Jesus' compassion for us and be so self-righteous that we now refuse to extend compassion. We're in. We deserve it. They don't. I deserve compassion. They don't. We think that while Jesus hangs on a cross bleeding for them, those people that we reject or compartmentalize or judge refuse to give a hand of mercy toward. We refuse to give mercy, God's mercy, to others. And yes, it is God's mercy we give, not just our own. You are the body of Christ here on earth. That's what Paul says again and again and again in his letters. You belong to Jesus and are no longer your own. Your mercy is yours to give, but also God's to give through you. God's mercy to give through you. We are instruments of the divine here on earth. We are ambassadors for the most merciful God and Savior. We are instruments of the divine here on earth ambassadors for the most merciful God and Savior. And when we give grace and love and mercy, it is God giving it to that person or those people through us, God himself who lives in us through the Holy Spirit. Remember how John says in 1 John that God is love. If you say you love God, you too will love your brother. Right, that whole... God is love. Why does he say that? Because that's what God is. So if God is love, you will be loving. If you say that you know God, you will be loving because God is loving. It's the same with compassion and mercy and extending it to those that you don't think deserve it. Do you love God? If it's really true, you will be merciful as he is merciful. The story of Jonah ends rather abruptly. We don't know how Jonah responded to God's instruction. Isn't that interesting? It doesn't say what he, what he said after God told him that they actually do deserve his mercy, whether he got the message or not. That abrupt ending is an invitation for you, the audience, and me, the audience of the story this morning, to consider your response. For some in this room right now, God is sitting next to you and the withered plant at your feet trying to teach you of himself as he did Jonah. Those people that you refuse to extend mercy to, those people that you show no compassion for, they are worthy of my compassion. And if they are worthy of my compassion, who are you to say they are not worthy of yours? If they are worthy of my compassion, who are you to say that they are not worthy of your compassion. What excuse can you bring before God? National security, justified hatred, religious reasons. Are you above God in your ability to judge, in your wisdom, in your cleverness, in categorizing whole groups of people or family members or friends or enemies as lawbreakers deserving only of punishment? God extends a hand of compassion to those people you have judged those people you have distanced, those people made in God's image and you spoke ill of them and incited others to do the same. I've heard it. <laughs> I've heard it. Those people of whom you said they got what was coming to them. They got what was coming to them. God sits next to you in that withered plant of your self-righteousness and my self-righteousness. And he says this, you are the lawbreaker just as much as they are. You deserved much more than you received. And not just your sins, but your culture and the fruit of it too. By the measure with which you measure people, so too you will be measured. If, we're honest, if we honestly reflect on ourselves, we deserve much worse. And when you're given that realization, there are two ways you can go. You can say, well, at least I'm saved. At least I'm saved. Or you can say, with Jesus, you can say with Jesus, therefore, I must be compassionate. 
because he is compassionate. I must give abundant mercy and grace to others because he has given abundant mercy and grace to me. And if that's not your answer, then you have erred. Hit the reset button on your view of humanity. Let God do it for you. So much in culture and media and literature and pop psychology and your friend's advice wants you to stratify your life and to create layers of groups of people or individuals in your life who are beneath you and undeserving of the compassion you can give. Instead, adopt the higher and better path of God himself, who, as Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, causes his reign to fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. That is the bar for the mercy that we give to people. We have no place to judge, to, to refuse to extend mercy, compassion. I'll close by reading a passage in Exodus where Moses met with the Lord. It's from Exodus 34. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with Moses as Moses called upon the name of the Lord. And then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Moses made haste to bow low toward the earth and worship. Will you pray with me? This is from Psalm 25. Make me know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you, I will wait all the day. Remember, O Lord, your compassion and your loving kindness, for they have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your loving kindness, remember me. For your goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in justice and he teaches the humble his way. Jesus, you have been the perfect example of mercy and we have closed our hearts to people. We have closed our hearts, we have clenched our fist and looked away and not given mercy. We have thought ourselves better, deserving, and others undeserving. But your radical compassion is far beyond that. And Holy Spirit, we pray together, breathe compassion through us through your power, that we would truly represent you, our Lord and our God.